So one of the problems that you can study in physics is what is the quickest path to get from one point to another. Let's suppose, for example, you're trying to move from one point that's over here up and to the left and another point that's down here, down and to the right. Uh, let's suppose that vertically they are separated by a distance of one and for convenience of the way I set up my code, uh, let's say that the horizontal distance, pretend that's a straight line, is uh, 5.72. Um, that number, like I said, came out of the way I set up my code. It doesn't have to be that number, but let's just pretend it's, it's that number. It's a random number, right? It's, it's a number that doesn't have any special uh, significance, really. And the problem is the way it's stated is finding the quickest path from the top point to the bottom point. Now, the shortest path in terms of distance, obviously, is a straight line. Um, again, pretend it's a straight line. But is that the quickest path? Is that the path of shortest time? For example, when, when, you, when you slide down here, you're going to have a constant acceleration going down this way. And we're going to make the assumption that we're in a uniform gravitational field pointing downward. Um, obviously, you're going to have a nice constant acceleration going downward. But are there other paths that might give you a quicker amount of time? For example, if you make this thing a little bit sharper at the beginning and then a little bit shallower at the end, can you end up with a faster time because you're picking up more speed at the beginning? On the other hand, you're not gaining as much speed at the end. Uh, or is it better to start out shallow and then become sharper? Um, I think it's pretty easy to argue that you need to become sharper and then shallower because you're picking up more speed at the beginning and you're going to retain uh, some of that speed down here at the bottom, you're just not gaining as much at the end here. Um, but then the question becomes, you know, can you go to the extreme of that? Can you go really, really sharp and then really, really shallow? Is there some kind of cutoff point? And the question becomes, what uh, among this banana of shapes here is the fastest shape, the one that will minimize the amount of time getting from this top point to the bottom point? And this is actually a question that our potential energy rubber sheet code that we've been exploring the last few weeks uh, can help us to answer. Uh, remember that you set up a potential energy over here and then you use that to calculate the force using the gradient function here. Uh, we're really only going to be working in one dimension along the x. I've got the, I've got the z direction set in there, but there won't be any uh, potential energy dependence upon z, so we're only worrying about x. And so y in this case is the value of the potential energy. So we're using that to simulate a shaped or a curved uh, path in a, in a uniform gravitational field. It works out the same way. And so the first thing that we're going to try on this is a power law. So we're going to have a power in here that's going to be the power that we raise our position to. So the way we're going to scale it is we're going to take 5.72 minus position times x or positions x component. Um, the reason we're setting up this way is so that we definitely have a zero at x equals 5.72. We're raising that to the nth power, so that gives you the sharpness of the trajectory over here. And then to keep this scaled up to one, we're dividing by 5.72 to the n power, because when your x coordinate equals zero, then you have 5.72 to the n power divided by 5.72 to the n power. So you're always going to start out at one up here. Um, and now what we're going to do in order to investigate this thing we're going to try out different powers of n. So we've set up a loop here. We're going to loop over n going from 1. Uh, I guess technically this only goes up to 29, so let's change this to 31, so it'll go up to an even 30. And basically we have the same kind of setup we've had before. Now we're not going to actually create the potential energy landscape because that's going to make the code run uh, much, much slower than we want it to because of all the extra visuals on there. But you could add this back in to help you visualize it. It's not too terribly exciting. The, the ball is going to follow the shape of the potential energy. That's about all we're going to see. Uh, so we create the ball, and then we... Uh, I wanted to just double-check the ball's initial position here. So we've got if n equals 1, we're going to print the ball's initial position. And then we use the Euler-Cromer method with our potential energy calculation of the force. And then we're going to create a graph. This is the most important new thing here. Uh, this is a graph of the power law along the horizontal axis, the, the power that we're raising, uh, that, that we're using in the potential energy and then the amount of time that it takes for it to complete. And we are resetting time t equal to zero here before we go into this while loop so that each time uh, we, we start with a fresh time. Um, and then we'll print the ball's final position here at the end just to make sure we ended where we thought we would. So let's press control two to run this. So there's our linear attempt, n equals one. 
uh, and equals two and equals three. You can see it's getting sharper each time and it's definitely picking up more speed each time on the way down and then that speed is kind of carrying it forward on the flatter portion here. If we go take a look at our graph, we can see that we are getting a decreasing time for powers of n, but it's leveling out pretty quickly, right? So after, uh, you know, after the first few powers, the, the slope starts to change pretty dramatically. You can also see that evidence here where the curvature stops changing as drastically, right? When you go from a power law of one to a power law of two, it's a pretty drastic change in the curvature. Going from two to three, not quite as drastic a change. From three to four, not as drastic a change. And by the time you get up here, um, it's, it's not a very significant change at all between the curvature. They're all kind of blending together. And that's kind of reflected in the times here. You can see that it's leveling out. Um, it's, it's, it looks like it's approaching some kind of asymptotic value, maybe just above four, but it's kind of difficult to tell. Um, and we are starting and ending at the points that we want. We're starting at zero, one, zero. So an X value of zero and a potential energy of one. Again, we're not worrying about Z. And then we end at an X value of 5.72 and a little bit of garbage picked up there uh, and then a potential energy value of zero. So this graph kind of inspires you to want to look for what this uh, asymptotic value is that, n to the, that, that X to the infinite power would produce uh, that this curve is approaching. And is it possible to get that minimum value with some actual function? And it turns out it is. You can prove that the minimum time path is actually not a power law, it is a cycloid. So a cycloid is something I want to do a video about in a future, they'll be coming out soon. Uh, but cycloids are the shape traced out by a point on a wheel that is rolling around, and so it produces a cusp in the middle. Um, and the way you can set up a cycloid, let's head back over to our code. You can set up a code as a parameterized function. Um, basically you use an angle theta and you set up these two equations to create a cycloid. Um, we'll actually set up the uh, the rubber sheet this time so that you can see what this function looks like. But the shortest distance, or excuse me, the shortest time function is called the brachistochrone, and so that's why I'm storing the information about the cycloid in brac points here. So this is going to give us the points along this trajectory. Now because it's a parameterized function, I can't just put in an X and get out a Y, I have to generate the points ahead of time. And then when I want to calculate my potential energy, I'm gonna linearly interpolate between those points. So we're pulling in our linear interpolation code that I released uh, this past summer. Um, and we're just, yeah, we're just doing a basic linear interpolation. That's fine enough for, for these purposes. And so basically uh, uh, you, you search for the point to the left of the point you're interested in and the point to the right you're interested in. And then you just do a, a Y equals MX plus B to get the potential energy at that point. I'll include a link uh, to that video in the description below so you can get a little bit better idea of how this function works. But basically the rest of the code proceeds as usual. We calculate the force from the potential energy the force goes into the euler kromer method here. So really the only thing that's changing is we're making our potential energy function a little bit more complicated by having this linear interpolation. But let's hit control two and uh, watch this thing in motion. So here is our cycloid function. Uh, you can see it actually goes beneath the point that it needs to end at, allowing the ball to pick up a little bit more velocity as it goes from left to right. So it's a little bit longer distance than the power law gives us, but it's actually the shortest possible time. You can see we've confirmed that we're starting at 0, 1, 0 and ending at 5.720, right? I hope you won't begrudge me this extra, you know, 0.8% off of the, uh, off of the target value, but I think that's, I think that's okay. You know, you can tweak this a little bit and you can see that the minimum time is actually 3.42 which is way less than anything we got on this graph here, right? This was leveling out, um, I mean, it hadn't even gotten below four yet. And this is showing me that the minimum is a 3.42. So I think this is pretty cool. This is a problem we had to solve in advanced mechanics. Um, and uh, I'm very glad to be able to actually visualize it now uh, with this uh, vPython code. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.